Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum's webinar and podcast series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forum's Israel office, join us here each week to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good evening from Israel. Um, after the drama of last week, uh, there's a little less, little less drama certainly uh, this week, um, but certainly lots to talk about. Uh, let's start with two, let's say, sets of meetings that are happening concurrently uh, today, uh, even yesterday and tomorrow. First of all, there is the ceremonial aspect, which is, uh, I think we've talked about in the past, what happens after an election. The official election results were presented earlier uh, today, I believe, even though the results have been known pretty much uh, for a few days, but they have to obviously get the final exact results and they presented it to the president. Then he invited uh, each leader uh, actually, it was the director general of the president's office sent a letter to each uh, leader of all the parties that pass the threshold or have representation in the next Knesset to send a delegation to the president um, for discussions, mainly to say who they recommend as prime minister. As we know, the person most likely to form a government, and we know that will be uh, Netanyahu, uh, will then be invited officially, probably on Sunday. Uh, by the president uh, to form a government. He will then have 28 days. And if he needs an extra 14 days, uh, then that's what will happen today. We saw a number of parties. We saw the Likud, no surprise there. They recommended Netanyahu, Yashatid, no surprise there. They recommended Yeh Lapid. Uh, basically, we know uh, who will recommend Netanyahu. It will be Likud. It will be two, the two ultra-Orthodox parties, Shas and um, United Torah Judaism and the Religious Zionist Party which is actually made up of three parties. And each of the leaders of those three parties, uh, uh, religious Zionist party led by uh, Batalo Smotrich, uh, the Jewish power party led by Itamar ben Gvir, and even the Noam uh, party, which is one seat. Um, <clears throat> I think he came in number 11. Um, I can't remember his name, but basically he's a one seat party, but he got disgruntled the fact that he was being ignored and just treated as a party, not just by the president, but also by Netanyahu, which we'll talk about in a second. So he uh, wanted his own meeting, so he's going to get his own meeting, but it's clear that they will all recommend Netanyahu. He will get over 60, he'll get 64 uh, votes. So it's clear the president will have no option than to offer uh, former prime minister the chance to form, the, uh, to form a government and almost certainly will do and become prime minister uh, again, there were reports earlier in the week, uh, which were subsequently denied, but it's clear that there was some, there's some truth to it, that the President Herzog reached out to uh, Gantz and Lapid to ask them if there's any chance that they will form uh, a, a national unity government with uh, Likud. Uh, both sides, all sides, denied it, but it is clear from uh, what's going on behind the scenes that perhaps it was uh, worded in a certain way that would allow for denials, but it's clear that uh, there was interest in seeing if there was any possibility that uh, either of those parties would join. And Netanyahu, perhaps uh, the idea was to dislodge um, the uh, Religious Zionist Party or maybe the Jewish power segment of the uh, Religious Zionist Party. Uh, but at this point, it doesn't seem like any one party as a whole from the current government, the future opposition, will join with Netanyahu. And part of the feelings were laid clear with what was described as a hot mic um, event that happened within the last hour. Uh, hot mic, for those who don't know, is when uh, people make comments, uh, uh, you know, uh, public figures make comments when they think that no one's listening. They either have microphones on that they thought were turned off. So today in the, in the meeting uh, between Shas and uh, the president after, because, uh, the, uh, the, this president, I think he was the one who, who set the precedent of having these discussions live 
on Facebook, on YouTube, open to the public, well, open to the public online, but open to the media. You know, in these discussions, there isn't that much exciting that happens. President Herzog, you know, did ask um, some of the parties what they thought of some of the hot, hot button issues, where they stood on certain principles, where they saw policies of the next government. Nothing particularly exciting. But there was this one moment after the meeting with Schuss where President Herzog was caught uh, talking uh, with the Shas leaders, where he thought that no one was listening, uh, that he started talking about the Temple Mount, and it, you know, it has to be taken very seriously, and that he mentioned uh, your partner is making a lot of people wired around the world, obviously referring to Itamar Benkvir, the leader of the Jewish power section of the Religious Zionist Party. So that caused quite a ruckus, and there was an immediate... Uh, 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 release from the president's office and then Itamar ben Gvir's office. It's a bit of a storm in a teacup. It will die down, but it just shows that <clears throat> even in an era where everything is live, there's still, you know, sometimes more interesting things that go behind the scenes. Uh, as I said, that was the, the sort of ceremonial events the last couple of days. What's more interesting is happening literally a couple of kilometers or miles um, away from the president's residence in a hotel in central Jerusalem, where uh, incoming prime minister, if you want to call him that, Benjamin Netanyahu is holding court and meeting with the leaders of all uh, the parties in his bloc. And he met with them all separately. As I said, he met with Smotrich, met with Ben Gvir, and even the leader of Nam. And he wanted to hear what the uh, demands were, uh, both in terms of ministers what minister uh, positions they would like, and also policies, and also budgets. That's also extremely important. Now, what's interesting about these negotiations is usually in the past, Netanyahu likes to uh, you know, take as long as possible. He likes these 28 days. He, I believe almost on every occasion, as he even asked for the 14 days, because as negotiation, oh, the longer they take, uh, the longer they take. You know, people wait to the last minute if they're, demanding something and then the other side is saying no and they're saying yes and at some point at the last minute someone has to come down from a tree and everyone knows that in essence you have 42 days so usually these things get signed sealed and delivered in the last couple of days what seems to be unique uh in 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 this current situation is Netanyahu is very keen to get the government already up and running even before many of the policy issues have been decided there's talk of on Wednesday, I believe it's Wednesday or Tuesday of this week, the members of the new members of Knesset or the new Knesset is being sworn in. And there is talk, I think it's very unlikely because of the timetable, but there is talk of trying to also swear the government in at the same time. Obviously, you need to have a vote on the incoming government uh, and you need to have that 61 plus uh, or 61 at a minimum uh, votes to form uh, that government. Netanyahu is very keen to rush it along because then won't have to go too much into detail on uh, many of the policies. What is most important to note at this point, with all the you know, dire predictions that you know, democracy is going to be lost and they're going to be extreme on this issue and that issue, is at the end of the day, especially in Netanyahu governments, power is very much centralised. Netanyahu tries to ensure that he has as much control over as much as possible. And as we know, uh, despite the rhetoric, despite what is written about Netanyahu, he is very much a status quo person. He doesn't like to take too many risks, not economically, not diplomatically, not politically, uh, not on the security uh, echelon. So I don't think we'll see too many really out there extreme policies, we won't see any great reforms. Yes, we'll see probably some of the rollbacks of what's happened in the last year with the, with the so-called change government, which is the current government, but there probably won't be too many you know, crazy extreme uh, uh, ideas as the world is expecting. And that's what Netanyahu is trying to achieve by basically saying, let's, let's, let's first of all agree to ministries, let's swear in this government, and then we can deal with issues. Obviously, that's something which is being fought by some of his partners. He seems to have an ally in Shas's Arya Deri for this viewpoint. Arya Deri is probably uh, his closest ally today in the uh, in the coalition, probably the one he can rely on most. Um, but on the other side, you have United Torah Judaism, who are usually fairly, I don't know if I'd use the word extreme, but thorough in their demands. I remember 
uh, being part uh, on the periphery of being a, a, a coalition negotiations a number of years ago, and uh, as opposed to most parties which made five to 10 to 15 demands, uh, the United Torah Judaism had a list of 75 demands. Uh, so they're pretty thorough and they like to dig down into the details. They like to know exactly when their particular policies will come through. Uh, they really like to have all the T's dotted and the, uh, the I's dotted and the T's crossed uh, before they agree to sign on to, uh, to anything. So there could be a bit of a struggle there between these two worldviews, Netanyahu Derry, which is uh, let's just get this government sworn in, let's get moving, uh, and then we can talk about the policy issues. And on the other side, you have Smotrich, uh, Bengvir, and um, uh, Gaffney, uh, and the other leaders of the, uh, the Ashkenazi ultra Orthodox parties that really want to say, no, there's a lot of issues which are very important to us, which we promised the voters. We need to show that these are in the coalition negotiations and afterwards we'll have a lot less leverage and on that they're, they're particularly correct so what are some of the uh, let's say more interesting or more contentious issues first of all the internal security ministry is wanted by itamar ben -Gvir. that's considered extremely controversial first of all because he has a criminal record but also because he wants to have absolute full control over the police in a way that the minister um, of defense has full control over the IDF. Uh, there's already talk that he wants to shut down the anti-corruption uh, unit, uh, Nahab 443, which is uh, famous for investigating uh, figures like Eric Olmert, Victor Liebman, and uh, currently um, uh, Be uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And he, he, he and it, it, this is the rumor that he would then take that budget to fight lawlessness in the Negev, which unfortunately is rearing its ugly head almost uh, every single day. There's reports of uh, murders, shootings, uh, 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 violence uh, in some areas of the Negev. Um, a very contentious issue, which was brought up during the campaign by uh, Smotrich and others, and has now been supported by the ultra-Orthodox party, is to change uh, the law of return. The law of return is the law in Israel which allows a Jew to make Aliyah, to come to Israel. Uh, for many years of the state, there was no real contention there. Uh, you know, it was, it was widely considered what was a Jew and there was no great uh, debate. And then when there was, I think it was in the 70s, they decided to define someone who could make Aliyah as anyone who has a Jewish, one Jewish grandparent. So basically third generation. Uh, and that's been pretty much the standard ever since. And there are at least half a million people in Israel uh, who are not Arabs and are not uh, uh, any, uh, not Jewish are, are considered people of no religion. And that's been a, a big discussion point and debate in Israeli society for a number of years. Obviously, you have parties like Israel Beteno, Avigdor Liebman, who actually even talked in the election of doing an emergency great-grandfather clause, basically allowing someone fourth generation to be able to make Aliyah, especially from uh, the Ukraine and Russia in emergency situations. Well, uh, uh, Vitalo Smotrich put in his uh, campaign manifesto that he would like to close the grandparent clause and make it just someone who has one Jewish parent. Well, this has caused obviously a lot of consternation in the diaspora. And you can imagine uh, Victor Liebman uh, reacted very, very strongly and vociferously to it. Uh, but this is something which is supported by the ultra Orthodox parties. So when you have at least three out of the four parties uh, pushing for it, um, Netanyahu is certainly going to be under a lot of pressure on that side. On the other side, he's going to be under a lot of pressure from world Jewry uh, about it, uh, uh, Jewish leaders around the world. Uh, probably, as most things, I can't imagine it will be done on day one, maybe not even day two, maybe not at all. Probably it's something that will be under discussion. Maybe they'll find a compromise solution. But uh, again, playing into that whole concept of Netanyahu, who, who really doesn't like to take big risks and likes to uh, remain as much as possible within the status quo, perhaps could veto that in some way with a promise of looking into it. Perhaps there'll be a committee created. That's one of uh, his favorite tactics uh, to really push an issue down the road is to create a committee, knowing that it will take months, maybe even longer. And even then, it will, you know, uh, it, it will be off the table for a little bit and then the public forum, et cetera, et cetera. Probably the most contentious clause which is being debated at the moment, which seems to have support pretty much across 
the incoming government is what's called the override clause. Uh, for those who are following Israel's uh, legal establishment, judicial establishment, know that Israel has one of the most activist legal establishments in the world, where the Supreme Court has taken on itself powers that it isn't necessarily given. Israel, as we know, does not have a written constitution, unlike many other places in the world. So they have these quasi-constitutional laws called basic laws. And um, in the in the uh, 90s, uh, Aaron Barak, who basically became the Supreme Court Justice, uh, assumed certain powers for the Supreme Court to act on cases uh, that weren't necessarily under their, uh, I wouldn't say under their jurisdiction, but they hadn't been called upon uh, to deal with. Obviously, America's Supreme Court, if, if, if I understand it correctly, will look at cases that uh, by those who are directly uh, related to the issues. Here in Israel, you don't need to be directly related to the issues to bring something before the Supreme Court, and they can decide that laws are uh, unconstitutional uh, on uh, basic laws which are being created, but the Supreme Court was never really given that power, but it assumed that power, and that has become uh, the tradition ever since. While uh, there's been a lot of discussion, especially on the right, which feels that the uh, uh, makeup of the Supreme Court has been overly against them, and many of the, uh, the laws that they would like to pass have been overruled, uh, or they've been told to go back and re-litigate, uh, re-legislate them, and this has become a big bugbear on the right. They would like to have an override clause if the Supreme Court decides a law is unconstitutional. They would like to be able to have some way of overriding it. And also, finally, on that uh, judicial issue, at the moment, the majority uh, uh, on the appointments committee of the next um, uh, uh, Supreme Court justices it's pretty much the majority is by the current justices and the people in the in the system. In other words, that they can then replicate people with their own views, as opposed to somewhere like the United States, where they're largely uh, appointed politically. So Israel would like to, uh, at least I should say, the many of the people in the, unco uh, the incoming government, especially in the religious Zionist party, but also in the ultra orthodox, and even many members that they could would like to have a bit more balance towards uh, the uh, political, the, the public representatives, to be able to choose the people who sit on the uh, Supreme Court bench. That uh, is something which the left and the center, the current government, have latched onto as something which they claim is going to ruin Israeli democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And that's probably become the most contentious issue, uh, perhaps uh, uh, coming up to the uh, elections. Um, finally, the number of ministers, again, always we, we have a big discussion about that. There are some, most are proponents of small governments because they say larger governments uh, uh, are waste. But at the end of the day, in our proportional representative uh, system with coalition governments, you need to satisfy all the parties and each one will have the demands of ministries, of budgets. Uh, so it sounds like there's going to be around 30 ministers, they say. Don't forget this government at this point in time, although they are seeking some breakaway members from the uh, future opposition, uh, will be 64. So to have 30 ministers, perhaps even some uh, deputy ministers, will mean you know, over, over half of the uh, members of Knesset uh, will then be ministers. Perhaps they'll give up their position in the Knesset and the so-called Norwegian law and bring many other people to populate the committees, which you need to do to have a functioning uh, Knesset. Finally, uh, it seems like Netanyahu has, as always, some problems in the Likud, because while he's promising his um, partners in the coalition, or they are, let's say, they're making demands, uh, he also has demands from within the party. There's quite a lot of people to satisfy. And there's always these cries from within Likud, don't forget us. You know, if you're going to give away all the major portfolios and ministries to your partners, well, you know, we would also like uh, some. So there is talk uh, tonight, and probably what's going to happen is Netanyahu is saying to his partners, you can have quality over quantity. I'll give you some of the bigger ministries, but you, are, you will not be able to demand as many ministries as you think, because I have to satisfy my Likud members as well. So it remains to be seen exactly how that all, uh, you know, flushes out, perhaps by next Wednesday night we'll have more of an answer, perhaps not, um, but that's definitely something to keep their eye on.
So I'm happy to answer questions about this or anything else you may have of interest. All right, thank you so much. Carrie Hillebrand asks, can you speculate as to what concessions and goodies that UTJ and Shost will demand? Well, um, it's it's not really speculation because they pretty much demand the same things again and again. They demand budgets for their schools, for their yeshivot, uh, places of higher learning. Um, they, you know, in the last government, um, uh, finance minister Lieberman uh, basically offered those uh, uh, schools outside of the state system. It's a it's quite a complicated thing. There are there are, there are state uh, ultra orthodox schools and non state ultra orthodox schools which don't get funding but he offered those schools that don't get funding that if they will teach basic subjects like English or math they will be fully funded and one of the Hasidic groups accepted it but then under pressure they basically reneged on that and Netanyahu promised the ultra orthodox parties that he will fund their whole school system regardless of whether they teach any basic subjects no no you know minimum standards excuse me, in uh, non-religious subjects, uh, and they will be fully funded. Um, there's talk even of funding uh, education from 0 to 3, obviously. Uh, that's something which the uh, ultra-Orthodox community would enjoy, uh, having on average more children than, than others. Um, they will demand uh, something to be done on the hot button issue, which comes up every now and again of enlistment, because historically the ultra-Orthodox uh, community have not gone to the army, but there's nothing. Uh, the high court has struck that down as uh, you know unconstitutional and unfair. Uh, they will. That's one of the reasons why they will support the override clause. Um, they will also demand an overturning of what they call the tax on uh, soft drinks, which were uh, taxed in the last in the current government uh, for you know to try and lower obesity. Also on single use plastic. Uh, is taxed currently, and uh, the ultra orthodox community felt both of these things were specifically a tax on them. It was specifically meant for them, whereas uh, the single use plastic was one introduced by the environment minister because of environmental issues. But they will seek to overturn those two, and I'm sure that will be done uh, pretty uh, soon. Um, there were other minor reforms which they'll seek to overturn, but basically, it's making sure that they get budgets, making sure that they um, they have power within the religious institutions, which was weakened slightly under current religious affairs minister, Matan Kahana, who populated some of the um, uh, religious councils in certain cities and towns around the country, more religious Zionist uh, members, as opposed to Haredi, ultra-Orthodox. Uh, and on the issue of Kashrut, uh, what, what can, be considered, can, can be considered a kosher restaurant, uh, there was reforms there. They will seek to overturn all those. So they will seek to really not just overturn the reforms that were talked about and were worked on over the last year, but perhaps to make sure it's harder to do so in the future, to strengthen their control over religious state institutions, to make sure that none of their uh, youth will go to the army uh, or, or not be forced to go to the army as others are. Uh, and to make sure that they get budgets for their uh, institutions. Thank you so much. Uh, Barack Korkmaz asks, uh, so is it appropriate if we should say that the legal accusations against Netanyahu have been definitively washed away by the electorate? No, um, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, um, you know, he, he will get his <clears throat> majority um but how well, how people voted why people voted is impossible to say um and he is currently he's no longer under investigation he's you know he's in a trial uh and Netanyahu has said a hundred times as has his supporters that he they feel that there's no reason to stop the trial because he'll be acquitted anyway and there seems to be quite a lot of confidence in that um some of it's just bullish to sort of, uh, you know, say, well, if someone from another party does try and get rid of the trial, um, as has been talked about, you can say, well, it wasn't me, I, I knew I'd be acquitted anyway. Um, but if there is that confidence, then you let the trial go to the end. So I don't, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, a democratic vote uh, necessarily speaks to anything, because don't forget, Netanyahu 
Netanyahu's party only got a quarter of the total uh, of those that passed the threshold, obviously less if you include those that didn't. And again, not everyone who votes Likud will necessarily support the trial to be ended or Netanyahu or is convinced of Netanyahu's innocence in, in any of those particular cases. Thank you. And along those lines, Steve asks, is it not concerned that the potential new finance minister, Arya Derry, uh, was imprisoned for fraud and corruption is again and is again being investigated for fraud and corruption? I don't know about any new uh, fraud and corruption. He, he, he basically took a plea bargain, which meant he had to leave the Knesset. Uh, there is a debate if he is appointed as a minister, whether he'll be able to. Um, he claims that there is absolutely no legal reason why not. Um, I believe that uh, that the deal that was made did not contain moral turpitude, which means he can serve as a minister. There are those who say that he still shouldn't be able to, um, but he seems pretty confident that he'd be able to. And again, uh, you know, if if it is taken to the Supreme Court, I'm sure some. Uh, there's, there's, there are organizations uh, which will take it to the Supreme Court, but if there was a plea bargain and nothing in that would prevent him from becoming a minister, then it's a legal question, it's a more political question, and Netanyahu uh, needs uh, Shas. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 we don't know yet whether Ari Derry will get the finance ministry or Batal Smotrich. At the moment, it seems that those are the two leading candidates, Smotrich, it seems we'll get either the um, it, it, it's unclear exactly who is the front runner there. Um, don't forget Smotrich. Smotrich is the leader of the biggest party after they could uh, in the coalition. So he certainly has a lot of leverage, but it's unclear who will win out and, and what Smotrich wants more, if he wants the defense or finance, and he's playing one uh, uh, to make sure he gets the other. Uh, so we'll see those, uh, we'll see exactly how that plays out in the next couple of days. Thank you. Larry Greenberg asks, is there any chance of Israel Beitenu joining with Likud's bloc to make the government a wall-to-wall -wall right wing coalition? Any defections from Gantz's party to enhance the coalition? Ah. Well, uh, Yes, Yisrael Beitena for sure won't come into the government because not only have they said that they won't sit with Netanyahu, they won't, they've said they won't sit with the ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, so there's, I think, zero chance that Yisrael Beitena will join. Uh, I think probably uh, uh, that's unlikely because they've had an opportunity before and they haven't taken it. Um, I think the best chance is within Gantz's party. Uh, we've talked in the past about Zivelkin, uh, Sharon Cheskel. Um, so it, I think that's probably the most likely that there'll be two, three, or four uh, defections from within Gantz's party, but I don't see Gantz as a whole uh, joining the government. I think the government will be sworn in with 64, and unless they think there's a good chance before the swearing in, uh, that's probably what they'll start at, because also it'll be much harder to bring someone in later, because all the major ministries will already be full up, and you'd have to offer, uh, you know, any people who moved across something significant to do so. Thank you. And in our last minute here, uh, can you just talk about which rollbacks you think Netanyahu will will implement first for the, which the coalition role? government had? Uh, in which area? Any of the ones that he would first tackle, I guess, uh, any of the change government's uh, initiatives. Yeah, that, that I he'd think like at the end of the day, there, there weren't so many major, apart from religion and state, there, and uh, uh, and as I said, you know, the so-called tax on soft drinks and uh, single-use plastic, th those will be gone very, very quickly. And I think the religion and state ones will be dealt with pretty quickly. And as I said, I don't think we'll see massive, massive changes, especially not immediately because Netanyahu is very much about stability. He wants to have this functioning government for a couple of years. And one can imagine whatever major steps he takes, uh, he'll get uh, pushback 
whether it's from within government, whether it's from across the opposition or from leaders across the world and from Jewish leaders across the world who are already on the phone to him, uh, both who had said, you know, I don't know if you'd use the word warning, but certainly, you know, uh, putting out their nervousness about some of the things that were said during the election, some of the people who may be in the government. Uh, so I think Netanyahu would want to sort of calm everything and show the world that there's a calm, functioning, moderate, quote unquote, government. And if they are going to make any significant steps, and, and I think significant, you know, with a small s, because again, I think Netanyahu will try and moderate everything that happens. Um, I think if there are any steps, they won't be as big as some of the coalition allies would like. And they certainly won't be as immediate as some of the coalition allies would want. Thank you so much for that. We've come to the close of our webinar and podcast. Ashley, thank you again for taking time to update us this week. For our viewers and listeners, please join us Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern for a webinar with Sam Westrop and Benjamin Baer discussing Western Islamist turn right. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.